A very good morning to everyone. Uh, for those of you I haven't met, I'm Kevin Teo, and I head up the Knowledge Center at AVPN. We had a rousing start to the conference yesterday with members and speakers, and I look forward to continued conversations with a broader group of stakeholders around various venture philanthropy practices. Now, the world is becoming increasingly interconnected and multicultural, and giving back doesn't always imply giving back to where you are, but sometimes giving back to where you've been or where you come from. Also, it's become a lot easier to move resources, whether financial or human resources, to most parts of Asia. And for anyone involved in philanthropy and social development, that opens up a whole range of options, as well as considerations. This morning, we are very privileged to have two special guests with us who will share about their perspectives on philanthropy and social development in the US as well as across Asia. Ambassador Kurt Wagger, who is the US ambassador to Singapore, and Mr. Lawrence Lien, who is founder of Asia Philanthropy Circle and also chairman of the Lien Foundation. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the two gentlemen on stage. Thanks. Collaborate. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Perhaps we can start with Lawrence. If you can share a bit about your personal journey as it relates to philanthropy and how that has impacted what you're doing today. Mm -hmm. oh, thanks, Kevin. I apologize if, you, if some of you were expecting a DPM Taman. Uh, I'm a kind of an inferior stand-in, but uh, I think I know a little bit more about philanthropy than he does. Um, Philanthropy journey. I, I think there's a saying that says uh, that goes like this: uh, If you are not socialist when you are 20, uh, you don't have a heart. Uh, if you are not conservative, when you, by the time you're 40, you don't have a brain. Um, I'm not 20, um, but neither do I feel 40, although I'm, I'm past that. Uh, I, I think the language is not useful now because we, we want to have both a heart and a brain, um, and and that's my attitude towards. Uh, I think philanthropy is to use both the heart and the brain. Um, I suppose the heart came fr from the upbringing of um, my faith, you know, uh, being, being Catholic, being uh, very exposed to issues of social justice, and, um, and which is a Catholic church, and you can see the Pope being very strong about, and also uh, having those early opportunities to, to go to the ground and see things for myself. I think that it's important to build that empathy and an understanding of what people go through, and to believe that, well, you're not part, of, you're not just living for yourself. You're part of a community, and you have accountability and responsibility for other people, even if they are strangers. Um, and that has made me feel that, well, it's important. It's not just about giving back. Philanthropy is not just about giving back and giving what your assess is. It's about bringing up and people. You know, fighting for them is about social justice, not just charity. It's about um, addressing the policies, the, the, the structures of society that are so unjust and so unacceptable. Um, and, and therefore, I think uh, in a lot of the work that I, I do, and, and it's not just about you know, giving a little bit here, a little bit there. It's about change. It's about uh, being that change agent that I know that philanthropists can be. You know, one of the reasons why I'm, uh, I've set up the Asia Philatry Circle is that is, is in networking and collaborating very much in the spirit of APN that I believe that, that change can happen because uh, I, I strongly believe that you know, we, can't, we must do more than just give little bits back to, you know, and, and believe that that's, up, that's the work done. Thank you. Thank you. Ambassador Wagger, if you can share about your, your, your journey and sort of how that's influenced your perspectives on philanthropy. Well, I, I agree that I think every element, uh, or every faith has an element of to whom much is given, much is expected. Uh, whether you're Buddhist, uh, Muslim, Jewish, or, or Christian, there's some element of that. And I think the most exciting change that's happened over the last few years is the demand for accountability that uh, we all want to make the world better than we found it. I think that's uh, innate in humans. 
Um, but now we're saying, you know, I'm not just going to feel good if I, you know, put some money into a UNICEF box. I expect accountability. I expect to see real results. Um, and if not, then I haven't succeeded. And we're also holding ourselves personally accountable. So for me, I, I was also uh, uh, brought up with a deep Methodist faith. Um, but the, the flip side for me was I went to a Christian college undergraduate. So the one thing I uh, saw was a whole lot of people talking about their faith and not doing much about it. <laughs> and um, we see that uh, a fair bit around the world, I think. And so as I got older, one of the ways I got involved was through politics. In our system, uniquely uh, situated that if you support someone who's going to make a change, um, sometimes politics do it. But we also, you know, I was also involved in the arts uh, and education. My wife, on the flip side, uh, has, was one of the lar longest uh, board members for the largest uh, family homeless shelter in the state of Florida. She also did environmental work. But I think for our generation, there is this need um, to not only make a difference, but also see where we uniquely fit. And we're accountable, we ask accountability for ourselves as well as others. The United States has a culture of it. Um, when I was preparing and getting the latest numbers before this talk, I was even surprised to know that 95% of all Americans participate in philanthropy, with the average family uh, participation being over $3,000 per, per person. It's an incredible number. And so some, it's been suggested that, you know, well, you just have a culture of it. And I would say no, I reject that. I think that we all have that ability to participate but we have to make sure people understand that they can make a difference. I'll give you a great example. I've done a lot of arts fundraising in Miami, where we have a lot of um, immigrants from Latin American countries. Now, people from Argentina, Brazil, or Colombia will happily give to universities or schools or things like that, but there is no concept of giving to the arts there. So if you have a contemporary ballet company you're trying to raise money for, if you're from Brazil, you say, well, the government pays for that. I don't. And you have to educate as well as talk about what happens and what positive things come from it. And I think that Asia really fits in that model. I think there's plenty of things that have been getting funding uh, from philanthropists of all levels for decades here. It's only now that this organization uh, has, has really, there's a catalyst to say, okay, we can do more if we do it together. Uh, as Doug said, you worry about the the massive change to a sector rather than individual projects. And uh, that's been probably the most inspiring thing. I think, uh, I think government plays a role, which I may not have said three years ago before I took a job in government. I'm from the private sector. Um, and I have been pleasantly surprised to see not only what our embassy does, but our government's done, for example, um, with women entrepreneurs and in that sector and have done for years. And I think that had we not had a role we wouldn't be as far along as we are, but we have a lot of work to do, and we can't do it alone. But we can elevate, we can convene, um, we can educate, but we really are part of the collaboration. Thank you. And one, one of the key areas of our conference this year is looking at the five dimensions of venture philanthropy practices, uh, of which the blue one you can see on the banner is around multi-sector collaboration. Uh, Ambassador, thanks a lot for touching upon the key role of governments. Uh, both gentlemen here are either actively involved or have a lot of experience in this space. And I'd like to pose the question of where do you see governments playing perhaps a bigger role in enabling philanthropy, uh, triggering the grassroots to do more for their respective societies? I think first we have to go back to where we see the citizens and private individuals' role. I think I just want to um, re-emphasize re Ambassador's point about citizens you know, having an ownership of social issues and that it's not for the government really then to take over all aspects of life no matter how competent they are. First of all, I don't think governments, um, no matter how competent, like even the Singapore government can be good at everything. I mean, governments are not known to be innovative, experimental, um, because that's not in the DNA of them to be so. I mean, they, 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 pro they protect, they um, quite often defend the status quo, and, and control is quite often uh, important because stability is important for the country. 
Um, and so how do you, and, and also it's not desirable, I think, for citizens to give up that responsibility to, to, and, and to government and, and put all the burden on the government to solve all problems. Uh, because we are all, we must believe that we're all born free to exercise our will, our you know, use, our talents for the benefit of community. So if you can push down activities to the lowest levels, we should do that. And governments should enable that. And, and you must see um, philanthropists, you know, civil society actors, private sector as, as partners and not, and quite often, unfortunately, I think governments in Asia, uh, oh, I know in the US it's a lot more accommodating, but in Asia they view these actors as, uh, as threats. Um, and, though, and so the regulatory environment is extremely um, non-conducive for philanthropy and civic activity. I mean, I have been traveling quite a bit you know, around the region uh, as part of my new role as, as, a, uh, as APC head. Uh, in the last two months, I've been to China, India, Indonesia twice. Um, Bangkok, I just came back last night, midnight. I was in Hong Kong <laughs> last week, Japan, two weeks ago. So I've, I've seen quite a bit, and I, my conclusion is that I think quite often government is, um, is crowding out private initiative, you know, by uh, sometimes, well, controlling NGOs, overfund, overfunding them, and yet, and, and not giving them sufficient autonomy, um, and, and, and not helping to build that ecosystem that will uh, allow NGOs to thrive. Um, but, uh, and, and, and many countries don't have the tax incentives that are uh, conducive also for philanthropy. So I would, say, I would say, well, governments start regulatory reform. Um, China, I think many philanthropists are, are, are looking forward to that. Do you know that in last year, 600 new foundations were formed in China? The, the growth rate is exponential, it's phenomenal. But a lot of it is just intent because people are at the sites, you know, waiting for things to happen, right? They're just putting a legal structure there, saying that that's I, I want to do this. Uh, but I mean, if, if, if the government is capping salaries, it's uh, uh, our staff is uh, you know applying huge taxes on on, on share transfers to, to 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 these charities, people would would would, uh, would hesitate, you know, to do more. Um, it, in Indonesia, it's the same thing because I think that the background there was that the Yaya Sons were abused in the, uh, in the previous regime uh, and, and the laws were, were written very, very tightly you know, to control the activities of the Yaya Sons, the foundations. Um, again, we know that you know, for governments, there's a, there's a lot of fear. There's a fear of loss of control, of abuse by people. Uh, there's a lack of trust in the entire system. Um, but it doesn't mean that the, your, the, the, the solution is to stop activities because in not accepting that some abuse might happen and trying to put in place enlightened laws and regulations to minimize that abuse, you prevent all the good that is, happen, that is able to be done by private individuals. Um, but more fundamentally, I think governments need to have that mindset, I mean, apart from regulatory reform, of accepting uh, philanthropists, private sector, uh, civil society activists as equal partners at the table. You know, working, you talk about multi-sector collaboration. I mean, there's often uh, that distance, you know, that you know, I've got the political power, you, know, you, you just do what I say, <laughs> you, know, you know, sing according to my hymn sheet. Uh, but, uh, I think philanthropists and, and, and social sector people, they have a piece of the reality that you do not have. They have capabilities to do things that you can't do. They need to be with you and working together on the common problems. And, and, and that I, I really do not see enough of you know, in most of the countries that I visited. So if you haven't heard yet, uh, I'm candid to a fault, and here's where it's going to start. Um, <laughs> When you deal with uh, foundations and uh, the level of philanthropy we're talking here, is a lot of people who run the foundations or the funders for that have been very successful uh, in their business careers and uh, don't know how to talk to government officials. 
And uh, I've seen it in the United States, I've certainly seen it here, where you're so darn smart and uh, you're so good at what you do, and you're talking to some government official and you say, you need to do this on taxes because this place does it, and if you do it. Um, I would beg you not to do that, <laughs> really. I can take it, but, you know. Um, so I, I would say that uh, you have to speak the language uh, of government. So for example, we all here know um, what change that could occur in this region uh, if they change a lot of their tax laws um, and loosening some of the abilities. However, what does the government care about? In the United States, 11% of our jobs are provided by the nonprofit sector. 9% of our wages. Now that's what a government cares about. You also have the concept of going piece by piece by piece around ASEAN, but how about be strategic? From a, from a business point of view, one of the reasons that Singapore is the most attractive platform in Asia is because it is conducive to the way the West does business, Americans do business, and people feel comfortable here. So yes, it's possible to talk about what's going on in China or Indonesia or the other, but isn't it better to have an example where it's probably easiest to get some of it done, like Singapore, which is what our, our businesses have done for 50 years. So I think government's role is to provide a platform, but everyone who's in government worries about what's in it for them. They're accountable too. And just doing it because it's a good idea to help Myanmar if uh, Singapore changes its tax laws I mean, everyone wants to do that, but you, when you have a lot of things coming across your desk, you know, you have to prioritize. Make it a win-win, as they say. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's important that, um, I think that humility and grace are probably the two most important qualities in life. Um, in politics, they are lacked in abundance. Um, <laughs> uh, but I've seen a little bit of lack of that uh, when, when dealing with some of the larger foundations. And I, and I would suggest that you've got to, you, you've got to get that message across. Secondly, I think um, governments, no matter where you are from, care about numbers and numbers of people, not just voters, because not everyone votes in this region, but certainly number of constituents, because everyone's got a constituent. And I think it's important uh, that you tell the story about how diffuse the giving is in this region. Everyone's giving to their, their, uh, their house of faith. Everyone feels that they are trying to make the world better uh, than they found it. Um, you, your government needs to understand that. They, they need to understand that you're not unique. You're not a unicorn because you're trying to help. Um, that we all have this uh, push, this drive, um, frankly, responsibility. Um, you know, one of the reasons, uh, you know, people always ask me when I did politics, you know, why would you raise money for candidates? Because it, it is pretty distasteful, as you all know who've raised money. Uh, at least you're doing it for, in most respects, a good cause. I've had some candidates that are not so much. Um, uh, and the answer was because I could. That was my Rolodex. I, I had a connection with 50,000 lawyers nationwide um, that cared about an issue, and so that's what I did. Everyone does what they can. You know, I would have loved to write President Obama's speeches, but uh, capacity and competence did not really make me in that lane. But I could pick up the phone and call people and say, support this candidate. And I think that uh, I would try and uh, get the message as diffuse as possible. Um, you know, having someone come in on a, on a private uh, plane to lecture a government about environmental policy is something that al I've always found interesting. So I mean, we got to, you know, find the right messenger. Ambassador, thanks for touching upon the role of business earlier on in, in, in your comments. Uh, I was wondering if both of you could expand on where businesses can perhaps play um, a more tangible role, either through CSR or innovative business practices, and in doing so, impact social development in the region. This is the, the one part that um, I think proudly uh, American companies uh, are uh, in the forefront. Uh, I think that 
again, the sense of I'm not doing it because um, I'm so magnanimous. I'm doing because it makes a difference. American companies, no matter where they go, um, have a corporate social responsibility program for multitudes of reasons. Number one, they want to be part of the community. Number two, um, particularly the millennials, the most malign generation that I can remember, um, frankly, I think are the ones that are going to save us. Uh, because they care much less about um, financial re remuneration. They want enough to get on an AirAsia flight and hit Angkor Wat when they want. But they don't, they don't care about uh, the third house. Um, but they demand a sense of meaning to their lives. And the companies that have that as part of their DNA in a CSR pro a program that's more than just doing, you know, build a house once a year or clean up a beach, but in a meaningful, sustained, impactful way, will retain talent, people will be happier there, and the companies do it as a business imperative. Some of our competitor countries in the region and beyond don't get it. They just don't get it. They don't realize that people aren't doing this as some kind of missionary work. They're doing it because it binds people not only to their company, but also to the community. Um, and I think it's probably the, the one competitive advantage that, that we have had, and hopefully we lose it, because that means other people are catching up. I'll give you one, one example. Um, I think it's... Exxon bought Unical, so they were, they were grandfathered in to Myanmar. So they've been there for 20 years, the only American company. They've been doing CSR there for 20 years because that's just something they do. And you, know, you, you get the, the system-wide email and someone gets it in Myanmar and said, OK, we've got to do it too. It's become a model for what they expect of multinational companies to come in. They say, wow, look at all this assistance to the community. And it, frankly, it's one of the reasons that people clamor for American businesses to come in. All right. Yeah. Uh, traveling around Asia, I discovered that um, a lot of companies are distrusted you know, it, when they present the CSR activities. Um, I was well, with a philanthropist yesterday, and he was dissing one of his competitors because he said, oh, you know, they, they spend so much on this on the projects. They spend even more on advertising about what they've done for the projects, you know. Uh, yeah. uh, and and many CSR, I mean, a lot of the corporate philanthropy and corporate uh, social responsibility is run out of PR departments. So I think one is is really to to show, I mean, for corporates to show that it's not just about PR. It's, it's much more than that. It's much deeper than that. Um, but then again, it's not just about going, you know, touching many projects. You know, and, 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 and you know, hoping is that, that, that some would, would get traction. You know, it's about, I think, focus, being comprehensive, being strategic about it. Um, I like to see companies using really the assets, I mean, really the core assets, not just financial assets. I mean, even the, something that's related to the business to, to, uh, as, as a strength, you know, as something that they can use to further a social good. Um, and that means really picking an area and studying it quite comprehensively rather than many areas and seeing what sort of solutions. I mean, sometimes we are too fixated with the tools, right? Uh, so if something new comes along, social enterprise, wonderful, impact fund, wonderful. Um, and then let's hop onto that. You know, we are st sometimes starting with the tool first when we should be starting with the problem first and studying it and looking at, well, perhaps sometimes a philanthropy solution, you know, is, is you can use a philanthropy solution. Sometimes there is a business solution to it. You know, then please use a business solution if you, can, if, you, if you can solve it with a business solution, or it can be a hybrid. So, I mean, for example, I'm, I care a lot about aging issues. Um, and I don't think, um, in Singapore, we don't have assisted living facilities that, uh, that I, I mean, certainly not one that I put my mother or my father in if they, if they need it. Um, and for a company that's, let's say, into real estate, then they could start thinking about both ends of the spectrum. You know? uh, there's, there's opportunity in, in, in solving a social need with a business solution. There's also opportunities in serving the low income with a, with a philanthropic solution. Uh, someone told me the story about Sanofi. I mean, when they did the dengue vaccine, which is still not quite out yet, uh, it started in the philanthropic department because they thought they couldn't make money from it. 
But now they discovered actually the, the ones, the countries that would buy the vaccine are actually countries like Singapore who can pay quite a lot of money for it. Uh, and they will make money for it. But if they did not start with uh, it in, in the philanthropic department, they may not have discovered the vaccine. So I mean, that's a great story of, well, I mean, start the problem first. And, and, uh, and sometimes you know, the, the solutions will cross, will, will cross that. Uh, I saw the zero in red, <laughs> so I better stop here. Thank well, I'd like, to re I'd like to just hit that for a minute, because I do think uh, we all in this room agree that uh, motivation matters. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I found those two points being uh, at odds with each other. So I certainly believe in doing good and doing well. Um, and so uh, you talked about aging. Uh, the, the trend in the United States is, is quite frightening because my in-laws live in a place called The Villages, which is 90,000 people who are, are 55 and o over. And uh, their clubs start at 12.30 in the afternoon. They do line dancing. Uh, they're, they're, some of them are drunk on golf carts by six. It's really quite frightening. Uh, but they have a great time. Um, so we're okay with doing good and doing well, as in the dengue, but we're uncomfortable about CSR being run out of the press shop. So I, I, I think that those are I think those in conflict, because not everyone has our experience. Not everyone has our, in my case, uh, my, my faith-based or faith-based faith or my mother's sense of social justice. Uh, um, but exposure is important. And sometimes, um, if you're going out to uh, go to uh, Jemaya House here, which is uh, one of my pet projects here, is a, is a, the largest um, home for sexually abused children here, um, someone's going to come out there with me because the ambassador comes, right? But I can tell you, uh, you leave there going, what more can I do? So uh, I think you have to have multiple business lanes, right? You've got you've to you've be able to be impactful uh, with accountability for those of us who are a little bit more sophisticated. But I don't think you apologize for dragging some people along because that's the whole point. We can convene, we can get people to be exposed, we can educate, and um, if sometimes that's in a crass context, mm -hmm. I'm okay with that. And there you go. A lot to think about over the next two days in terms of why we do what we do, either individually or as companies, and also the role of governments. Ambassador Lawrence, thanks a lot for taking time off your busy schedule to join us this morning. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking these two gentlemen. Thank you.